Hi, my name is David Chandler. This is a response to Chris Moore's final video rebuttal in his debate with Richard Gage about the collapse of Building 7 on September 11, 2001. I'm an independent 9-11 researcher with ties to architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. But I was not a party to the debate, and I'm not speaking here for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. I'm responding directly to Mr. Moore <clears throat> because he dragged my name into the conversation. I would never consent to a scientific debate with Chris Moore any more than I would try to debate physics with Sarah Palin. Chris Moore does not understand even the fundamentals of his subject matter. He is not constrained by the laws of physics or the rules of logic. He simply makes things up. While he smiles, talks in an oh-so-smooth voice, and seduces the unwary listener into his fantasy world. Stay with me and you'll see what I mean. In earlier correspondence with Mr. Moore, I made the serious suggestion that he should take at least a community college physics class and pass with high marks before taking his show on the road. He took offense at that suggestion, but I was not trying to insult him. I was making the simple observation that it's irresponsible to get up in front of the world and make assertions about physics without a clear grasp of at least basic physics. In his final rebuttal to Richard Gage, Chris Moore reveals the depth of his ignorance of basic physics. Nowhere is this more clear than when he talks about NIST's velocity versus time graph of the roof line of Building 7. This is the graph that shows an approximate 2.25 seconds of absolute freefall. Some of you may not understand this graph either. There's nothing wrong with not knowing. Not knowing is an opportunity for learning. But I would hope you would recognize your limits and not pose as someone who is qualified to interpret it to the world. Here is what the graph is actually all about in simple terms. This is a velocity versus time graph. In a one-dimensional problem like this, since we're looking only at vertical motion, velocity and speed are pretty much equivalent. So I'll talk about speed rather than velocity since it's a more familiar term. I'm trying to keep it simple. Each dot represents a computation of the downward speed of the building at that particular moment, taken from position measurements on videos. If the dots line up horizontally, it means the speed is staying the same from one moment to the next, therefore no acceleration. If the dots line up along a sloped line, it means the speed is changing. The steeper the slope, the greater the increase in speed moment by moment, so the greater the acceleration. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, so you can read it directly from the graph by measuring the slope of the line. During the interval labeled stage 2, the slope of the red line indicates that the speed is increasing by 32.196 feet per second each second. This is the acceleration a rock would experience if you dropped it over a cliff. It's the steepness of the slope in stage 2 that proves the building underwent freefall acceleration. Understanding and using velocity versus time graphs to analyze motion is something you would encounter in the first semester of a high school physics class. This is basic physics, not rocket science, as they say. Another fact to be understood about the graph is the real data here are the little dots. The curve is an interpretation of the data. All measurements have some random measurement error associated with them. So a line or a smooth curve that is fitted to the data is a way of averaging out the small random errors of the individual measurements. A good fit should go through the data with approximately equal amounts of error on each side. There are formulas for finding the line that best fits a set of scattered data. That's what NIST is doing here. The red line is the best straight line fit through the points in stage 2. When Chris Moore discusses this graph, he refers to the curve as the freefall curve. 
and he talks about the data points as accelerations. This in itself is bizarre, but then he makes the incredible statement that for about a second in stage one, the acceleration is greater than freefall. This baffled me at first. The data points in stage one do not have much slope, meaning the speed is changing slowly, so there is very little acceleration. The acceleration reaches freefall only when the curve becomes steep in stage two. Anyone can see this, anyone that is, who knows the first thing about high school level physics. So how in the world can Chris Moore think the acceleration in stage one is greater than the acceleration of gravity? Remember, I'm a high school teacher. I see all kinds of crazy answers on exams. Crazy answers are my window into a student's misconceptions. I pay attention to how students explain their reasoning so I can help them correct their misunderstandings. When I went over Chris Moore's video a few times and listened carefully to the words he was using, it finally hit me what he was talking about. When he refers to the data points as accelerations, that's what he really means. He thinks the data points measure acceleration. When he calls the curve the freefall curve, that's exactly what he means. He thinks the curve represents freefall. He doesn't understand velocity versus time graphs, or random measurement errors, or curve fitting, or the slope of the graph. Whenever he sees a dot above the curve, he thinks it literally means the acceleration is greater than freefall. Let that soak in. Chris Moore has absolutely no idea what this graph is all about. I'm sure his unnamed expert advisors have tried to coach him, but even at this late stage of the debate, he doesn't get it. He is literally speaking gibberish. The only reason he can mouth these words with a straight face is he is truly clueless. You can't reason with someone who doesn't even understand the terms of the discussion. Let's go back to the graph. Chris Moore says that in stage two the acceleration is slightly greater than freefall, and he spends a lot of time and energy in the rest of his presentation trying to justify how this could happen. Where is he getting this? He is not getting it from NIST. NIST puts a best fit straight line, the red line, through the data points in stage two, and the slope of the line is exactly the acceleration of gravity freefall. There has been some discussion on various blogs about whether a slightly steeper line would better fit the data, but Chris Moore doesn't understand that either. So he points to the dots in stage two that lie persistently above the freefall curve. Of course there are points above the curve. The curve is drawn so it goes through the middle of the scattered data. He doesn't get it. He simply doesn't get it. Chris Moore's ignorance of his subject matter goes very, very deep. There's a lot more, but I'll leave it at that. Once you understand the depth of this man's misunderstanding of basic physics, nothing else he says can be taken seriously. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he's not a good person. It's just that he is not in touch with his limitations. He should not be getting up and making judgments about what should be a scientific forensic investigation. He's getting bad advice and he doesn't even have enough basic knowledge to recognize it. Richard Gage should not have tried to debate this man. Jesus said something relevant in the famous Sermon on the Mount. He says, Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before swine lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Debating someone with this level of ignorance is a very, very bad idea. If it appears to some that Richard Gage got trampled, this is why.